Well, hey, John, thank you so much for being willing to do this interview. And why don't we just start off with you just telling our listeners just a little bit about who you are and what you do. Yeah, I'm a writer and speaker, speak on positive leadership and also building positive teams. I get to work with incredible organizations like the Rams, the Dodgers, the Miami Heat, also the Tampa Bay Lightning the last couple of years, and a lot of Fortune 500 companies in terms of you know, anywhere from uh, SNAP and banking companies, Bank of America, to, uh, you know, to insurance companies, and you name it. So I get to work with a lot of different companies. I mostly speak on leadership and also how to build great teams. I've written 25 books, and also uh, we have a, a program for teenagers as well, Power Positive Leadership for Teens. And we're also in schools around the country with the Energy Bus for Schools. So even though I work with a lot of organizations, I'm really passionate about education and making an impact on uh, the next generation. Yeah. Now you mentioned all that, which is a super impressive resume, but you didn't start there. Uh, I know you have, uh, from what I understand of your story, uh, you know, you were doing a bunch of other things. You ran for city council, you owned a restaurant, and basically you came to a point in your life where you were miserable, at least your wife told you <laughs> you were miserable. And, and then you basically decided that you wanted to be a speaker and a writer. Is that correct? And can you kind of walk us through that transition? I thought that was really interesting. Yeah, very much so. I was miserable. I was definitely unhappy with my life. I was not being a great husband. I lost my job during the dot-com crash. So that was a really tough time going through that. So the fear, the stress, be, being you know, the sole provider of our family, it was a lot of weight to carry at such a young age. I was around 30, 31 years old. And my wife gave me an ultimatum. She said, I love you, but I'm not going to spend my life with someone who makes me so miserable. Like You need to change. And I had to change. I really had to to become a more positive person. I needed to deal with stress. I had to become more resilient. So everything I teach now is what I wished I knew back then. And I began this journey of working to become a more positive person, a better father, a better husband, a better leader. I started to research positive psychology. This was during the emerging field of positive psychology. It was very, very, in a, you know, early on in its, in its initial stages. And so I was doing this research and then practicing some ideas. And then I was writing about them and I started a newsletter, a weekly positive tip. And then people started to read this tip. And then eventually it grew from five people to 10 (laughs) and then 10 to 20. And that list is over 250,000 now, but this has been a quite a journey in terms of doing this work, sharing this message and then writing the books along the way and then speaking. And I always believe we teach what we need to learn. And so I was a student first and I still am, and a teacher second. So I learn, I synthesize, I then are, I'm able to apply it and help other people apply it. So I have a master's in teaching. I would say I'm, I'm, a, I'm a good teacher and I teach positive leadership. Yeah, and when you decided to make that transition into writing and speaking, is it it's true that you wrote a book in three and a half weeks or four weeks, your first book? Well, it was more so, what am I born to do? Why am I here? Mm. Why am I so miserable? I asked those questions and writing and speaking did come to me. And I'm like, okay, I'm going to do this. What am I going to write and speak about? And I didn't know, but I knew I wanted to be more positive. So that's why that led me to research that, to start to get into that. And then I realized that was my life's calling. That was my, my purpose. And I was in the restaurant business shortly you know, after that. So I, I lose the job during the dot-com crash. I open up a restaurant. We second mortgage our home, $20,000 in credit cards. I eventually would open several other restaurants, several other franchises for Moe's Southwest Grill, owning four at one point and made them really successful. We became one of the top franchises in the country just with our four stores. One location was one of the best in the country. And so that was pretty exciting doing that. But I also knew I didn't love the restaurant business. So I sold the restaurants in 2005 no one I wanted to focus 100% on on writing and speaking. And during that time of, of getting the restaurants going, again, it almost didn't make it. We were almost bankrupt. That's a whole story in itself, right? Just hanging on by a thread, literally just wow. trying to pay the bills and survive. 
and trying to make the place successful. We did whatever it took, marketing and flyering the local movie theater, going to local businesses, promoting catering. My wife and I did whatever it took. I was wiping tables down, working in the restaurant at you know, 29, 30. People thought I was you know just a worker there as a kid. And so that's what I was doing. And it was a great experience looking back, but at the time it was scary and it was hard and it was an uncertain time filled with a lot of fear. But we did make it work. It did become very successful. And then when I did sell, I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna continue writing and speaking, but I'm gonna do it full time. Cause I was just doing a little bit here and there, a lot of free talks, some paid gigs out of town, like whatever it took, I was I was doing it. And, th- and now I'm like, all right, I'm gonna focus 100% on doing this. And so I sold the restaurants and then all of a sudden everything dried up. The speaking mm-hmm. dried up and I couldn't think of what to write, it just wasn't going well. It was a really crazy time when I look back, but it was a time of stillness. It was a time of solitude. It was a time of really going deep, like, who are you and what are you here to really say and what do you want? And one day while walking and, and praying, to be honest, uh, the energy bus came to me. I wrote it in three and a half weeks of divine inspiration. And then I was going out to speak in Las Vegas and I saw that Ken Blanchard was going to be there. And Ken Blanchard was there for some event. I forget what. I reached out to his assistant saying, I'm going to be there. Would Ken have any time to get together? And then I reached out to Danny Gans, who had read the manuscript for the energy bus. Didn't even read the book, read the manuscript I had sent to him because I saw him on a CBS This Morning show, which is a pretty wild story. I never really told the story publicly. And he read the manuscript, reached out and said, hey, this is a great book. I love it. I think it's going to be great. Like so nice that he would do that. Invited me to a show backstage. I asked Ken, would you like to go meet Danny Gans and go backstage? (laughs) <laughs> He's like, sure. He brought his wife. I brought my wife. And we all went to meet Danny Gans backstage and developed a, a great relationship. And after that, because Ken taught at Cornell, I went to Cornell. We had dinner beforehand. I was really nervous, of course. But we had dinner beforehand, went to the show, really connected. And then I was in San Diego with my family over the summer. And he invited us to his house like on Father's Day. That's the kind of nice guy he is, like the amazing wow. guy. And we went over there. And I asked him, hey, would you ever write the forward to the energy bus? And he said, um, "He said, yeah, I'll do that. And he did. And I think that's one of the reasons why it took off. I owe him a lot that he would do that. Obviously, one of the most prolific and successful business authors in history with the One Minute Manager and him endorsing the energy bus. But I wrote in three and a half weeks, divine inspiration, didn't know it was going to take off, took five years for it to become a bestseller. Bookstores wouldn't even carry it. It was rejected by 30 publishers at first. So it's been on a journey of itself, right? The journey of the energy bus is a journey I had to go on. And now it's more popular now than it is, you know, than than it was last year and the year before. So it's pretty cool that I still speak on a book that I wrote when I was 35 (laughs) and I'm 51 right now. Wow. And it's pretty cool that I'll meet people that said, hey, when I read that book in college and I was 18 and they're like 30 something now, I'm like, I can't believe it's been that long. I don't feel that old, but clearly it has been. But that's been the journey of of doing this. And that led me to write the no complaining rule, soup, which is about building a culture of greatness and the shark and goldfish training camp, which is my favorite book. And then more recently, the carpenter, the power of positive leadership, what makes great leaders great, the power of a positive team, what makes great teams great. And then all the, you know, books that I'm going to be writing. I have one coming out with a guy named Alex Demchak, a young guy who I've been mentoring and it's called the sale and it's about integrity. So I'm excited for this new book. Wow. Talk to, can you talk to the person who may be in a similar position that you were in, when you were 30, that, you know, you were miserable, not doing what you loved, you know, that process of actually getting clear on what you wanted and, and really just ha- even having the courage to go after it. Uh, what would you say to those people? You think about what would I want to do every day? Because no matter what you choose, it's going to be hard. So it will be difficult. You will have to work like no other to be successful at anything. So what do you want to spend your time and energy doing? Like if you said, John, do you want to build up an investment fund and manage that fund. No, I'd be miserable. Would you like to be the CEO of this company and run this particular company that is perhaps in energy or crypto? No, I like to invest in crypto. 
I'm really into crypto these days, but I don't want to run a company that's all about crypto. My friends are doing that and I think that's great, but I have no interest in that. So it's about becoming clear, like, what do I want to do every day? What am I willing to work towards? And I remember thinking, yes, I want to write and speak. I know I feel a calling in that. Not everyone has that calling, right? Who wakes up and says, I want to be a motivational speaker, you know, or like they might say, I'm a motivational speaker. No, I don't want to be a motivational speaker, but I'm not even a motivational speaker. I'm a leadership speaker. But in your own mind, like who wakes up and says that? But I did. And so it was like you know, at 30 years old, 31, 32, even if it took me 10 years, I said to myself to make it, to be successful, that's okay. Cause I'll be doing something I love. And when I'm 40, and I'm successful, I'll now have the rest of my life to continue doing this and loving it. So that's what I tell people, like think about what it is you truly want to do, what you love, what energizes you and, and have that vision and say, what am I willing to work towards to get there? And what will I want to do every single day? Like my daughter, she loves to cook, but she's very clear. She does not want to own a bakery shop, which she would love to bake, but not again, every single day. We talked about her being a dermatologist because she loves skin and loves, you know, like just loves the whole aspect of like when people have to get surgery and the they get to have to get like um, cut deeply. Like she wants to see what the cut looks like. Oh, She's man. really into that. I don't, to me, that's crazy, but she loves yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> but part of her would be great at that, but she's like, I don't think I'd want to see people come into an office every day and sit mm -hmm. in an office and look at people's skin and cut their moles out and cut their things out. That's not really what I would want to do. So as you started thinking about that, that helps you to think about what do I want to do? So get clear on that. And then what is your vision and mission? Like what is your mission? What is your purpose? And what's a way that you can live it? Because we can all have a similar purpose, but find many different vehicles to live it and share it. So find out what is right for you. And then it is a journey. There's no straight line quest for the purpose that we're meant to live. It really is something that we go through and it's a, an adventure we have to go on. It's challenges that we will face. And you're going to find many jobs that you hate to find the one that you love, I think. And I, not everyone goes through that, but for most people, get out there, try different things and see what works. And so often things just happen, right? You meet someone, they have an opportunity, you go work there. That leads to meeting someone else and you go there. I've heard so many wild stories of how people came to do what they love and there is no exact science. So be open, be flexible, but get clear on what it is you love and want to do every day and what you would enjoy doing and what do you want to build? Do you think that helps Doug? Oh, absolutely. And I do want to narrow down on what you chose to do. Uh, I would love to hear, you know, we live in a culture where I think a lot of people do want to be speakers. They want to be authors. Um, you've clearly built your platform. Everyone wants to build a platform today. You know, let's just start with writing and then I'll get into speaking. What have you learned about um, just writing as a business and then maybe the art of writing? Um, how do you write books and what advice would you give to aspiring authors? So for me, writing as a business in terms of like making a living at it. I was told that if you want to write, you have to speak. And so speaking is how writers often make money in terms of leadership or culture building, unless you're a, you know, a, a fictional writer and you're writing stories and, you know, John Grissom style, but to do this kind of work, you really do have to get out there and speak. So I early on knew I had to make a living as a speaker as well. I was going to be just making money as a writer. So that's one thing. Also, every book I write usually takes about three and a half to four weeks. So I am different than a lot of people. And so I can't expect what works for me to work for everyone else. But every December I'll write. And the idea is that you get up and write. Like writers write. That's what Stephen King said in his book on writing. You write. And then I take a walk. I get ideas. I come back. I write some more. And I'm usually done by noon and then I relax the rest of the day or I'll, you know, do other work, of course. And then that night I'll read what I wrote. I'll edit it, come up with some new ideas, write them down and then start the next morning and try to do that every single day. And so it's the diligent process of writing and you just get better the more you do it. So I've done a, you know, a lot of books now. And so I've gotten better over time, but I, early on didn't know I could write a book. And I think for a lot of people, they're scared to write a book or they think they have to have a publisher to write a book. Here's what I tell people. Just write your book. Don't wait for a publisher. 
write it, create it. First draft, write your book. Create an outline. Know the main topic, the main gist. Don't write three books. Write one book because we often have like all these different ideas and we try to combine books. Just write one core book, one core message. And if you died next week, what book would you want to be representative of you that you would want to share with the world because you can't talk anymore, right? You're gone. So what would you want to share with the world? What's so important to you? It has to get out there. That's the first book you're meant to write. When you're done with that, ask the next, ask the question again, what book do I need to get out there and share and do that? But first start with that first book of what you're meant to write, create the outline, write it, and then think about how you find the publisher, or how it gets out there. But first write it because you'll be thinking about publishers for years and never write the book you want to write. And so good advice. just sit down and write and don't worry about the outcome. Don't worry about, Oh, if it's good or not. Don't let the fear step in. Don't let that critic voice come in. Just write. And then when you're done, you can go back and edit it and tweak it to make it better. But just first write. And I've told a lot of people that. And a lot of people have written books since doing that, which is great. Not everyone gets published, but some do. But a lot of people self-publish. And I think that's great as well. So there's a business to writing. There's a business to speaking. And I made most of my money early on speaking not as much with the books, but when Energy Bus started taking off and then the international rights were sold to Korea, South Korea, of course, the largest foreign rights deal Wiley's ever done. No one could explain why to this day. I made you know some money doing that. But yeah, I consider myself a writer first and I yeah. speak on what I write about. But you know, I made most of my living for years as a more as a speaker. But now the books are doing phenomenal because there's 25 of them and <laughs> they continue to build and reach more people, new audiences. They continue to grow, thank God. And I just love reaching people. And I always tithe my, you know, percentage of a large percentage of my book sales. And several of my books, I give the hundred percent of the royalties to wow. charities. And that's always fun too. The books do well. And then I'm giving back uh, with those books. And um, you know, I, I I enjoy that process. Oh, I love that. Uh, to talk about the speaking business too. So if that had to support you, what advice would you give to, to people who want to speak professionally? I am curious, you know, did you, I, I've heard you share that, you know, you spoke basically anywhere that would have you, but did you seek out speaking opportunities? Did you join a speaker's bureau? You know, what did you do to, to grow your speaking platform? Well, you can't really join a speaker's bureau early on because no one really wants you to speak and speaker bureaus don't care about you if their clients don't want to book you. So, right. The idea that, oh, I'm going to get a speaker bureau and they're going to book me just is a myth. You have to get out there and start speaking. And as, as clients request you to the bureaus, they take notice of you. So that's really a key factor. So for me, it's about getting out there. I did a lot of free talks everywhere and anywhere early on, like 80 free talks. And then it was about speaking to as many audiences as possible. Yes, I reached out to chambers and companies and friends who are VP of sales. I'll come speak to your company. Let me know. I'd love to speak to your group here. And I spoke to some friends, small groups of, of sales groups and for free, right? But next thing you know, they're a client and you put them on your website. And then you have another client of a big company name and you did their sales meeting and it's 10 people, but you did it. And they're a client. It's a little harder today, like, and easier in some, in some ways. Like now it's, there's a lot of people doing it. And there's also a lot of um, Instagram, social media, LinkedIn. So if I was doing it today, I would really use the social media and the LinkedIn and those different platforms to share my message and get it out there. And I think the key is to provide value. Like for me, it's always been provide a lot of value and give a lot away, like make a difference, make an impact. My newsletter that I've been writing every week, it's always filled with value. Yes, we promote our stuff in it, but the core of it is this newsletter. It's short. You can read it in a few minutes, but it's something that you're going to be able to use and take away and provides value. And in doing that, you earn the trust of your audience. And we've never done sponsorships of my newsletter or anything like that. So it really is a, a personal relationship of going out there, speaking, adding value. And the more you do, then people start to reach out and they want more of it. And a lot of my speaking is referrals. 
a lot of it is people who've, who have heard about me from someone else, but you have to get out there and start doing that for people to refer you. So my big thing is make a website, put your information up there, create your core message of your talk, come up with your outline of it, give an overview slash one cheater, a way to clients that they have, send it to different people. I have hundreds of emails. Hey, I'm John Gordon. I'd love to come speak to your group that I've saved all the way back from 2000 and like, <laughs> uh, five, 2005, wow. 2006, have all those emails still. And 99% did not get a return email. Wow. So, and then two more questions, if I can get them in what, you know, you get to work with sports teams. You, you mentioned many of them and many of them have gone on to win championships, which is a lot of fun. Um, when you get an opportunity, I had an opportunity to share with a professional team here. I'm just curious when you go in, you know, what, what do you look to bring to that team and the time that you have with them? So it just depends on the talk and what they want me to talk about. But for a few teams, I talked about grit and team grit and how to be a team that is connected and committed. And also the mindset that allows you to be your best. I also do a talk on the power of power of a positive team. And what makes a great team great? So these are the principles and practices that will make you a great team. And if you follow these principles and you implement these practices, you're going to have success. And you'll be able to tell halfway through the season how well you're doing based on following those principles. And all the teams I've worked with, I've seen that. So the first team I ever spoke to was Jack Del Rio and the Jacksonville Jaguars. Jack read the book, The Energy Bus. Mike Smith gave it to him. Mike had read it, thought it'd be good. Jack reads it. I get a call out of the blue from Jack Del Rio. I go down and speak to him and meet with him. He's this big imposing guy. And he said he loved the book and he would love for me to speak to the team. I said, I'll speak for free if you get everyone a copy of the book. He's like, yeah, I'll, I'll do that. Bought the copy of the book, copy of the book for everyone, including the custodial staff, the, wow, the cool. food service workers. He wanted the entire organization on the bus. And they went to the playoffs that year. They beat the Steelers in the first round. It was an hey, incredible. Hey, hey. I'm from Pittsburgh, if you didn't know that. Remember that year? It was incredible. I, I remember that year. Maurice yeah, Jones so I, wish you, I wish you wouldn't have spoke to them. Yeah. It was an incredible, magical year. And so, yeah. you know, again, you can't, you can't just make that happen, even if you tried so often. It was something that just, you know, again, I look back, it was, it was a blessing and I was able to do it. And it led me to now start speaking to more teams Others heard about it. Mike Smith brought me the Falcons and the University of Texas called and the University of Georgia called and all these things just started happening. And I started speaking to teams. And so I've, I've been speaking to teams now for years uh, doing this work. And I do love speaking to teams because you can see firsthand whether these principles work. Like you could tell in the course of the season whether the team is applying the principles. With corporations, you don't always see it right away. But with teams... You do it and the whole world sees it. How are they performing? Do they have grit? Are they overcoming adversity? Are they working together? So it's really great to always see how it, how they play out and how the principles come alive. Yeah. Last question. It's kind of a subject change, but you alluded to your person of faith. You pray, you, you tithe, which I love. And my understanding is actually you, you got led to Christ by Erwin McManus or through his ministry. And, you know, I've been following Erwin for years. I'm just curious, you know, what have you learned from about faith or from Irwin in your time um, being under his, his leadership and yeah. the ministry sense? Irwin is definitely who led me to, you know, my faith in, in Christ. And early on, I had a lot of doubts and a lot of anger towards hypocrites. And he said, John, don't let Christians keep you from Christ. And that mm -hmm. was always a great, great wow. message for me and really made a big difference. And from his sermons, they really spoke to my heart. And now like we're great friends. And so it's so funny after all these years, we're actually great friends. We'll argue, we'll play pickleball, we'll play basketball, we'll compete, we'll do all those things. And at the same time, he's still my pastor. And so when I'm watching him on stage or I'm listening to his sermon, he's Erwin the pastor. When he's with me, he's my friend and we're battling. So it's a, a fun thing that way. But even when we're together, we always talk about deep issues, deep topics, and he is one of the most brilliant people on the planet. Like he is just a genius of the way he thinks about things. So I feel really fortunate and lucky to be able to receive that as a friend and, and as someone who is, um, you know, a mentee of his. And so we're, when we're together, I'm, I'm learning a lot and I'm asking questions and he always makes me think. 
and always helps me, you know, think about things differently. Just like the other day I tweeted and this tweet was inspired by him, but I said, you know, the most dangerous people are not the ones who know they're evil. Like it's the ones who actually think they're doing good in their eyes and they think wow. they're saving the world and they will justify their harmful actions in order to do it. Like we can't tell the people because this is for their good, but we have to do it. And so they think they're doing good, but in many ways they're creating harmful actions, which ultimately lead to demise. But in their eyes, they don't see that as evil. And what we know is that evil will distort truth with lies. And so you have to be careful in this world today to really figure out what is good and what is evil. And it's hard. And so Erwin and I will talk about that because I'll be like, man, that leadership, that's, that's just evil. He goes, no, John, it, they're not trying to be evil. They actually think they're doing good, but there's, they're being misled. And I don't always, he goes, like, I'll blame them. He'll be like, no, don't blame them. Blame the fact that they're being misled and they're being deceived and they're believing the lies. And that helps put things in perspective. So we'll have those kind of conversations. That's beautiful. It's so powerful. Well, hey, thank you for your time today. Anything else you want to leave leaders with as we conclude? I want to lead with the fact that as a leader, it's, it's essential that you feed yourself in order to feed others. Like I am more passionate and convicted than ever about the power of positive leadership because we have seen over the last two years firsthand the difference of leadership. Teams with great leadership, organizations who had great leaders, they thrived. Teams and organizations that had poor leadership, they crumbled. And you saw the impact of leadership on people, on the morale, on organizations, on hearts and souls and how they were able to do you know, their work and deal with the challenge as they move forward. Did they communicate? Did they connect? Were they committed? Did the team, did the team stay together? Did that leader lead with fear or with faith? Were they controlling or were they empowering? And so... I saw firsthand the impact of leadership. So I guess now more than ever, I don't guess I know, I am so convicted about positive leadership that it's, it's my mission now to develop positive leaders around the world. And we have a positive leadership training now. We have a train the trainer program. So we're training trainers to actually deliver the program to develop leaders because that's how wow. you multiply. Can't do it alone, right? You multiply yeah. through people that take this model and help develop great leadership. Because we need, we need it in our schools, our businesses, our sports teams. So feed yourself in order to feed others. And if you don't have it, you can't share it. And optimism is a transfer of belief. Leadership is a transfer of belief and optimism. And so you want to lead better? Transfer your optimism and your belief to others. And that's how you're going to make a greater impact. And it's not Pollyanna positive. You know, this is not about seeing the world through rose-colored glasses. This is knowing that you have the power to overcome the thorns. It's not about ignoring reality. Like great leaders don't ignore reality. Great leaders say, this stinks. This isn't good. Here's how we're going to overcome. Here's how we're going to get better. I am not political, right? I do not get involved in politics. I don't, I've supported the person, not the party over the years. But when there's inflation and it's really bad, and then a leader says, well, you know, it's actually going to be good for us. That is ignoring reality. That is not <laughs> dealing with reality because we know inflation right. is not good. So don't lie. Speak the truth. Okay. We're dealing with inflation. Let's figure out a way of, about how we overcome. That would be a lot better because that builds trust. That builds trust. And trust is the currency of leadership. And there have been leaders in the past from other parties who I have not liked and I have not trusted and who have, who have lied as well, right? So, and, right, right? And don't lead the right way. So I'm, you know, that's what I'm saying. Like for me, I really would love to see like great leadership lead our country and lead every, you know, every at every level of our organizations because that's what we need and so i'm i'm committed to that let's go i'm with you well john thank you so much we'll include links to everything that we talked about in the show notes and uh just thank you for the work that you do it's impacting leaders and people all over the world appreciate hey, it thanks doug i appreciate you